I suppose if uh, Sunday is the most important day of the week, and I believe it is, then Easter Sunday is the most important day of the year. Uh, for today, we realize the, uh, the culmination of Holy Week, the Lenten season. Uh, if you were with us last week, you know that I preached uh, on Palm Sunday concerning uh, uh, the crowd, and when the cheering stopped, they at one point were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but it wasn't but a few days that they began to cry, crucify him, crucify him. And so uh, we come to this important day with hope, for the story didn't end with crucify him. There was a whole lot of shaking going on, a whole lot of shaking going on in the final days of Jesus' earthly ministry. Using figurative language in describing Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Matthew, re recall, uh, as I preached last week, said the whole city was shaken. There was something uh, uh, cosmic taking place. And it was an atmosphere charged with religious zeal. People were asking that day, who is this? Who is this who would be entering the holy city, receiving and accepting the crowd's affirmation, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is this? Your answer to that question may well determine how you live here and now and how and where you live in eternity. The crowds that day answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The prophet. It's the same thing the people said after Jesus fed 5,000 that day with five loaves and two fishes. Perhaps they remembered Moses' prediction concerning uh, the one who was to come. Moses, as recorded in Deuteronomy 18.15, says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. And then he goes on to say, you must listen to him. Who is this? The prophet. Well, that's the truth, but that's not the whole truth. While Jesus stood before Pilate, the governor asked, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, surprisingly, because up until this point he would not have made such a statement, but this time he said, yes, it is as you say. And then you know the story, the story that we know all too well. Pilate's soldiers stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a, a crown of thorns and, and set it on his head. And according to Catholic tradition, the same crown of thorns, this relic was rescued from the devastating fire at Notre Dame, Notre Dame Cathedral this last Monday. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, they placed above his head the written charge against him which said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Of course, in those days, uh, 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 the Roman idea and the, Ro and the Romans would instill this and demand this from the people. Uh, the idea was that there is no king but Caesar. And so this was an inflammatory, uh, but yet at the same time, kind of a mocking way to reference Jesus, the king of kings. When they nailed him to the cross, this was what was above him. And it was true, despite the fact that it was meant to be a derisive, uh, mocking insult to him. Jesus, the prophet, the king of the Jews, suffering mental and physical anguish for hours on the cross until finally the Bible says he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from, 
from the very top to the bottom. Keep in mind that the curtain of the temple had restricted access of the people from the very presence of God. Uh, the temple was designed for uh, stages and, and uh, three different areas, and uh, there was the, the holy place, but yet there was also this holy of holies where, where the priest could enter in on the Day of Atonement and, and make a sacrifice for, for the people's sins once a year. But um, in this case, with the atoning death of Jesus, it was marked by the curtain, the curtain being torn in two from top to bottom. The old sacrificial system comes to an end. From that time on, every believer, yes, you and me, we have access to the very presence of God because of what Christ has done. That ought to get an amen from us. If you've got one stored up, you ought to say it right there. We... This is a mind-blowing thought that we, little old me and you, we have access to God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. We need not go through a priest in order to find the presence of God. From that time on until today, we have immediate and unrestricted access to God and the forgiveness of sins accomplished through the death of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews underscores this fact when he said, We have confidence to enter the most holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Who is this? The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the high priest of a new covenant. When the temple curtain was torn, the earth shook. There it is. <laughs> whole lot of shaking going on. The earth shook and the rock split. So much so that the tombs broke open and the bodies of many, many holy people who had died were raised to life. These were dead men walking. They came out of their tombs and they appeared to many people after the resurrection. There were four miraculous events that accompanied Jesus' death. There was, there was darkness. There was a, this tearing of the curtain. There was an earthquake and dead people rising from their tombs. The crucifixion of Christ could not have gone unnoticed. More than a prophet, more than the king of Jew, the Jews, Jesus was and he is the high priest of a new covenant. And between two common criminals, Jesus suffered and he bled and he died because he loves you and me. No man really took his life from him. He willingly laid it down for us. He paid the price for our salvation. In verse 54, it says, When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, I'm... I'm uh, Looking here, verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and explained, exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. The prophet, the king of the Jews, the high priest of the new covenant, the Son of God. With each unfolding event, Jesus' true identity was being revealed. What a day. I want you to look with me now at, at chapter 28 of Matthew, and let's pick up the story as the, as the evening, I'm, I'm sorry, verse uh, chapter 27 of Matthew, beginning at verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it on his new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. 
fearing that the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, the chief priest and the Pharisees, with Pilate's blessing, made the tomb as secure as they knew how by putting an official seal on top of the stone, the huge stone, and posting a guard there. In ancient times, seals were used to denote official uh, verification and certification. Uh, an angel of the Lord came down here. The story doesn't end with the crucifixion, but we go on to read that uh, in chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There it is, another whole lot of shaking going on. There was a violent earthquake. For the angel of the Lord came down and, from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, Matthew says, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Again, the seal was uh, that which made it uh, all the more difficult, I think, for anyone to explain it away. The seal probably bore the name of, uh, of Pilate, perhaps even Caesar. But the story doesn't end there. Aren't you glad the story doesn't end at the grave? Spoiler alert. <laughs> On the third day, there was another earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled back this huge stone that, that Joseph of Arimathea had, had placed there. Michael Jordan uh, was talking about Tiger Woods um, winning of the Masters last Sunday. And Michael Jordan knows something about comebacks. <laughs> uh, he, uh, in case you've been living under a rock for the last century, you probably need to know that, that Michael Jordan was probably the greatest basketball player of all time. And he decided to make a little adventure into uh, uh, baseball for a couple of years, but he made a comeback, went back to the NBA and played. So he knows something about comebacks. But, but Michael Jordan this week talking about Tiger Woods, who, who won the Masters after 11 years or so from, from winning a, a major golf tournament, he said that uh, this was the greatest comeback ever. Well, excuse me, MJ, but that's not the case. This one is the greatest comeback ever. One who had been dead. Uh, the third day rising again. There is absolutely no comeback that's greater than this one. You might say the lamb is the goat. G-O-A-T. Greatest of all times. Okay, you get it? See what I did there? <laughs> the lamb is the goat. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. In his book entitled Six Hours, One Friday, Max Licato said, Jesus unmasked death and exposed him for who he really is, a 98-pound weakling dressed up in a Charles Atlas suit. I like that. <laughs> but that huge stone, that stone which the Jewish leaders believed would provide the incontrovertible truth that the world had seen the last of this Jesus. Enough with him. That stone has become the, the symbol of his victory over death. We see pictures of it everywhere. I scrolled Facebook this morning and I saw many, many different pictures of, of the tomb that was empty and, and the stone had been rolled away to the side. When Jesus was coming into the world, angels announced it. And now an angel comes again, and his purpose was to roll the stone away. And G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher of another generation, not, said, not so that Christ might come forth from the grave, but to show the world that Christ had already risen from it. He had risen before the angel ever came. He had left behind the linen cloths without displacing them, and the grave without rolling away the stone. But I just love this imagery. I, I don't know if you read the Bible with imagination and, and look for some humor. Uh, I try to look at humor in most everything. But I just love this image of the angel sitting on top of the stone. 
It's as if God is taunting the enemy and saying, is that all you've got? Is that all you've got? Here he is sitting on top of the stone. The very thing that they thought would keep the comeback from ever taking place. The seal, the heavy stone, all of that was, uh, was powerless in the eyes of Jesus. The guards were paralyzed with fear, and you would have been so as well. Had we been there, we would have probably been uh, paralyzed. We would have probably been like dead men. <laughs> it says that. Um, how ironic. Uh, I, I see here some irony in the fact that the ones who were assigned to, to guard the dead themselves appear dead while the dead one has come back to life. And it's interesting to me, and I won't go down this trail, except to say it's, it's just interesting to me that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women. For they were not considered to be uh, uh, queens as we would like to think of them today. Uh, in those days, women were mistreated. They were, they were second-class citizens, and they were objects of, of men's lust, but they were not considered to be uh, as, as important as men. But it's interesting to me that the eyewitnesses, the very first eyewitnesses of the resurrection were Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. There was a huge stone in front of Jesus' tomb message of Easter is that God moved it. I want to remind you today of some good news. We are Easter people. We live between two resurrections. We who were dead in our sins have been resurrected to newness of life. And uh, there is coming a day when our bodies will be resurrected, we'll be caught up with the great resurrection in the last day. Uh, the truth is that we are Easter people, that we have hope. Now, Easter people can be male or female, rich or poor, Democrat or Republican. The thing that we have in common is that, that we were absolutely dead and hopeless in our sins until God raised us to new life in Christ. But for us to be Easter people means much more than a day of celebration. And kids, it means a little bit more than, than candy. I like those responses. Predictable. <laughs> for us to be Easter people, it means that the very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that is working in and through us in Romans chapter 8. We are Easter people, but let's face it, we are living in a Good Friday world. Bad things happen to Easter people sometimes. There are issues in our lives that are too big for us to handle. There are stones in our path, and each day we, we look at stones that, that are obstacles for us as we journey this route, stones that trip us. And stones that trap us, stones that are too big for us to handle. The good news of Easter is this. If you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear this. God still moves stones. Aren't you glad? When trials come our way, it's his resurrection power that sustains us. It's not our ability to handle things on our own. It's not our intellect. It's not our physical strength or any such thing. It is because he lives that we too can live and we can face tomorrow. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. The price of salvation has been paid, in other words, but he did not say, I am finished. He was just getting started. He's still moving stones today. Now, stones come in all shapes and sizes. Some of those stones might be in the form of illness, and some of you are going through illness right now. Some of those stones might be in the form of financial reverses, maybe separation or divorce. 
perhaps drug addiction, perhaps an addiction to pornography, which is crippling the church of Jesus Christ these days. And stones can overwhelm you. They can kill you emotionally. They can kill you physically and spiritually. But the good news of Easter is that God is still moving stones. He's still in the resurrection business. John's Gospel, chapter 20 and verse 7, tells us that the napkin that was placed over Jesus' face in the tomb was not just thrown aside like the grave clothes. It was neatly folded up by itself. I've been wondering why John would uh, include this fact in his narrative. Was it important? I, I begin to think so. If you want to understand the significance of the folded napkin, the burial cloth, you need to know something about the Hebrew customs of that day. Now, there are some who would disagree and some who would question whether it was a real custom, but scholars disagree on this. I want that to be clear. But the folded napkin pertains to the master and the servant relationship. Uh, while the master would be dining, uh, uh, the servant would uh, uh, be off to himself and observing things and uh, making sure that everything was in its proper place. The servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating. He would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. And if the master was done eating, he would rise from the table and use the cloth to wipe his mouth, perhaps to wipe his beard, and, and toss the napkin onto the table. The servant would know when he was finished and he would then proceed to clear the table. The wadded napkin was the signal that I'm done. But if the master got up from the table, folded the napkin, and laid it beside his place, it meant that he wasn't done yet. And it meant to say to the servant, uh, I'm coming back. Friends, Jesus isn't done yet. Friends, Jesus is coming back. The good news is that even while we are Good Friday people, the good news is that even while we will struggle along this journey with stones in our pathway, some that uh, will, will be too large for us to cope with on our own, the good news is that Jesus still moves stones. He's not finished. He's not done. Until he returns, he will continue to be in the resurrection business. Many of you, perhaps most of you this morning, have been resurrected to new life. The stone of sin has been removed from your life. You have trusted in Christ and him alone for salvation. Uh, you've realized that uh, church membership or baptism or association with good works and things like that were not enough, and you have come to faith in Christ, and, and because of that, the stone of sin has been removed from your life. Others, perhaps of you, uh, have, have once known that relationship with Christ, and the stone had been removed from your life, but you have somehow drifted and backslidden but I'm happy to report to you today that our Jesus, our resurrected Lord, can still, in this day, he's not finished. He is still removing the stone from the backslider. I'm pleased to report to you this morning that anything in your life that keeps you from spiritual victory, and it very may well be an addiction. I've told you before about my younger brother who is addicted to drugs and and uh, uh, all sorts of things right now, even though he grew up in the same Christian home and had his picture made on Easter Sunday with my siblings uh, on the front porch. Uh, he's struggling today because of addiction that has so gripped him and uh, sent his life spiraling downward. Uh, it seems like a hopeless situation, but the good news for me this morning and my family is that my younger brother Keith can be freed from that addiction because Jesus is still moving stones. I'm hopeful today 
because of the empty tomb, because the stone has been rolled away. I am hopeful that uh, anything that comes forth in my life that is a stone or in the lives of my people, my friends, my family, I am hopeful today because Jesus is still in the business of resurrection. My question for you today is, what is your stone? What is it that is tripping you up? What is it that's trapping you? What is it that is keeping you from experiencing life to its fullest? Think about that. Whatever it is, might be a very huge stone. Might be something that you feel like has a seal on it. <laughs> something that could never be removed. Don't let the enemy of your soul convince you that that's the case. He is out to be the author of confusion. Uh, the enemy would want us to believe that there's no hope in some situations. But the good news is that this same Jesus, yes, he was the prophet. Yes, he was the king of the Jews. Yes, he was the suffering servant, the Savior but he is also the risen Lord. And because of that, we have hope today as Easter people.